So um, my name is Carson Kuznier. I'm from Dalhousie University in uh, Halifax here in Canada. Um, and this poster is accelerating encrypted data stores using programmable switches. Let's zoom in a little bit here. So sort of the um, beginning or inspiration for this poster was looking at um, uh, allowing people to leverage the cloud who historically haven't been able to. Um, so if you're dealing with um, sensitive information um, or you're worried about like extra, you know, larger impact of potential data breaches, um, using the cloud might be restrictive. Um, I think the big one right now would be like medical information. There's a lot of need to share medical information, but um, it's inherently private, I guess. Um, and so encrypted data stores let you use the cloud or extend your storage capabilities um, while at the same time providing some protection for your data. But doing this comes with a performance cost. Um, not only do you have to encrypt everything, you're trying to restrict the information you share with the remote servers as much as possible, which means you have to do more processing at the client or some sort of client proxy. Um, so what we've tried to do is essentially use programmable network devices to um, accelerate these queries. Now, um, they rely on, as I said, additional processing. Um, so by network devices inherently are high throughput, um, kind of low latency devices, um, but they have a very uh, limited subset of things they can do. So by restricting ourselves to what we can do in the network, um, we can take advantage of some of these uh, throughput and speed benefits um, and also reduce some of the congestion that can kind of occur at these proxies. Also, we, you know, it saves, all of your traffic is gonna have to probably pass through a, local, a switch at some point. So um, it just saves having to do some extra trips to a separate proxy or something. So on the data plane layer, we're gonna try and do as many operations as we can. So for the system, uh, we basically do it in a BMV2 software switch running a client server network in Mininet. Um, the host and the server are running a zero DB encrypted database. Um, so in this database, everything's encrypted on the client side and the client will build B-tree index, indexes and store those in the server. And then on future lookups, the client will request um, the root of the B-tree essentially. Uh, the server will send that, the client will decrypt it and that'll tell it what to, requit, what to request next. So traversing an index is a series of round trips between the client and the server. And so our system essentially is going to um, try and accelerate this. So what we do is uh, the example, the operation we've done here is just added caching to the data plane. Um, we parse a little bit of the application layer data to see um, what type of operation it is. And then if it is like a read operation, uh, we're gonna check it against our cache. Um, in networking caching, has been done, um, but we've made a couple of improvements here. So um, with each key, we store a block map um, and a hash map. Um, the block map tells us which um, blocks contain values for that key. And then the hash map tells us which hash algorithm to use um, to find the index into that particular block map. Um, so one thing we've done is that we allocate our blocks in um, increasing powers of two. This lets us service um, values of any size. So we don't have to worry about padding out our values. Um, and if we're storing a couple different types of indexes potentially, uh, we can store them if they're different sizes without worrying about padding. The other advantage is by using different hashing algorithms and the hash map, we don't need the same index for every block array. So 
this lets us analyze our data and we can um, reduce the size of unused block arrays. So maybe, you know, like a, the 16 byte block array only has one or two entries. We can reduce the size of that and that lets us save overall um, memory consumption uh, of the system, which is good because there's not a lot of memory on switches. So for our preliminary results, um, we sort of investigated the round trip time reduction we can gain from this. Um, so we filled an encrypted database, CRDV database with 5,000 random entries and ran a series of queries on it. Um, our results showed, you know, around a quarter of the round trips we reduced. And this is just by caching the top layers of that B tree. Um, so a pretty good performance improve especially if we have like high latency links potentially. Um, and yeah, so our next steps for this system is to um, move the solution from, you know, a mini net simulator to a hardware switch. Um, you, doing this, we can get a better idea of the like latency improvements we're gonna get. And also we wanna move like, move beyond just caching. So there's a lot of operations that are handled by these proxies that could potentially be moved to the network. Um, so more recently, we've been looking at doing some kind of frequency smoothing uh, along with caching to kind of protect against um, sort of frequency analysis and attacks that way. Uh, so yeah, if we have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Not a good. Otherwise, I'm happy to hang out for a few minutes, anyways. Well, actually, I have a curiosity more than a question. That's cool. I mean, in general, before your approach, how does I don't know the how does all the back pipeline works or, or worked? So typically a client will send a request, it'll be routed to a proxy. The proxy will handle like encryption decryption and then it'll pass it to the remote storage. So the idea is um, skip that trip to the proxy if we can. Okay. And in oh, this right. case with the caching, we're gonna skip the trip to the remote storage entirely. Um, yeah, and this is sort of the, these encrypted storages, the main thing they're trying to protect about it against is like a, a, a passive observer. So like kind of a, an honest but curious um, adversary. So the, um, the implementation that you've done with the mini net um, is that, you know, able to deliver the performance levels where the results that you're at are absolutely interesting or um, relatively to some other similar proxy version? Um, well, there, the zero DB in particular doesn't actually have a proxy um, or the proxy and the client are essentially the same system. Um, so, but in terms of reduction in round trips, uh, it, it's promising. And in terms of like memory reduction, if we were to use a uh, traditional, um, like uh, Netcash is the main people who've done this. Uh, if we were to use their technique, I think we'd use 10 to 20% more memory than we have here. So, but the proxy would be local, right? So, I mean, the- um... yeah. The, the the round trips between that, you know, the same type of CPU in a proxy that you are using now within Mininet. Um, so did you do exactly that comparison? Uh, no, I guess. Is, so the, the plan moving, the, the idea is to try and move some of these proxy operations. The example right now doesn't use a proxy. So essentially we just, cache encrypted data and we're trying to stop the round trip to the encrypted data store. 
which a lot of cases is more costly. Okay, so maybe I'm I'm still not getting it completely, but I'm 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 looking at the left hand side where okay. effectively the way I understand it, the P4 NK CKV would be doing the same thing that the NK CKV proxy would be doing or right. could be doing. Right. So and then in that case it sounded as if the only saving were the round trips um, on, you know, and CKV proxy to switch. Um, yeah, so we're saving round trips to the encrypted data store, so across the internet. No, I don't, no, no, wait a second. So I, I don't understand that. Um, I'm saying the, I thought you were, you were saving round trips between the switch and the proxy. Oh, no, sorry. That was a, uh... The overall approach is to move operations into the switch that may be handled by some sort of proxy. So if your proxy does caching, we're not gonna have to go against CREP. Basically, we just compare it against um, the native solution and we saved over, so a round trip in this, the green bar case, I guess, would be to the proxy across the internet and back. Right. No, no, but this is this is the point here, right? Especially when you're saying that um, your implementation is, if I understand correctly, Mininet, a software-based implementation yep. and not really a native P4 one, then right. um, I think uh, the numbers that you're getting, you know, would be fairly close to the one if exactly the same software would be put not in a switch, but in that uh, local proxy that's co-located to it, right, on a stick that you have on the upper picture? Uh, yeah, potentially. Um, yeah, potentially. Okay, okay, cool. So, no, no, uh, uh, minimizing the number of round trips over the internet, of course, makes a lot of sense, but that wasn't clear. So then yeah. the second point is when you're moving it into P4, um, how much of what you're doing there is... Uh, you know, in a data plane in, in such a way that um, you'd be able to say that if you had, let's say, uh, real P4 hardware, then it could be significantly faster than, you know, you could do it in software on a proxy. Um, so uh, I think, so you're saying how much faster would it be? No, I'm trying to understand how much of the functionality is something that you think uh, is done in P4 code in such a way that, that the, let's say, barefoot switch could do it right. in, in Tofino. Right. Uh, so for the caching, um, essentially all of it, or the entire solution right now is just a P4-based solution. Um, ideally... But you have an idea if, if the, because I'm, I'm not aware to what extent something like a uh, Tofino would have, you know, the amount of memory um, and, you know, the subset of P4 features required to do it, right? So it's not clear yeah. to me how much of, yeah. Th that is like a definitely a concern. Um, one of the hopes is that if we can show like a lot of performance with this kind of stuff, we can get maybe more support in the future. So ideally, if you had like a, some like cryptography hardware support, um, you can move the encryption decryption to a switch as well. And sure. that would be really interesting. Um, but that doesn't exist right now. Right. Well, so I would say that what you've shown here primarily is the, the benefit of something that would already be possible today by putting it into a high performance proxy. Right. Um, even right. if you, if you, if you uh, can't get it into the switch. So, the question of whether or, you know, what exactly, you know, type of switch hardware you'd need to, to make it actually the benefit of the switch hardware, that is still to be to be shown, right? Correct. Um, one thing a lot of, or the proxy is often the bottleneck in these type of systems. Um, so I'll, I'll, there's a number of different um, encrypted data store solutions, but a lot of them have congestion issues at the proxy. Um, so moving anything, I th the idea essentially is by moving what we can to the data plane, 
will hopefully relieve those congestion issues. Now, admittedly, I think you could keep adding more and more powerful servers, um, but uh, I, I guess that's a trade-off. Right. Well, thank you very much. Well, thanks for your question. No, no, it, it's a it's a, a concern of mine too. Um, but you press on and see what uh, results you can kind of get. Do you folks have any, you know, ideas to get Tofino or so to actually start investigate with, uh, you know, real hardware? Um, not, <laughs> not, I'm just, not really, but it, it would be, I think there's definitely potential if you have some kind of cryptograph and it, ideally this Tofino switches would have cryptographic support for other, you know, network functions anyways. Um, but uh, I guess it's still relatively new, so. Well, I mean, there there seems to be two main P4 functions to investigate, Ron. One is <clears throat> whether, you know, encryption, which may not be there, but the other one is the uh, the caching of the packets, right? Mm -hmm. um, the data that, that you packetize somehow. Uh, what was I just going to say? Can't slip my mind. Yeah, uh, it would be cool. And oh, another thing is um, with these encrypted systems, um, breaking the connection or like having people. People are nervous about having something in between two systems. Um, sort of having, uh, you know, a device in the middle. So a, a sort of parallel problem, I guess, is uh, an a secure way to implement these intermediate network processing. But. Well, that's, that's always a matter of how you look at it. Right, right. Where somebody sees a man in the middle, I'm just seeing a distributed system on the left-hand side. Right, right, yeah, that's true. But yeah, that's true. I guess it is perspective, but. It's not as if this box does this without the user application on the left-hand side endorsing, supporting, and wanting it. Right. No, that is true. Sort of our um, use case in that thing setting this up was, you know, if you're in a hospital, you have a bunch of clients that might need to ask us some remote storage, and then you'd have you could they might have the resources to have some kind of high powered switch that would speed this up so which hospital do i need to get to to be depending on a cloud <laughs> services to get healthy again just wanted to avoid that hospital yeah no kidding um uh, i'm not sure i don't think any yet but you never know uh i think um administration and information systems aren't always on yeah, the same page. Like <laughs> so I can only imagine. All right, I'll have to go. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. Just try one time if, if we see that it's not possible, it's the same. Okay. So, uh, can you see me? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, my name is Anton Chekashev. I am from Russia. And uh, this is our joint work with uh, Vitaly Dimenyuk and Kirill Kogan from Aero University, Israel. So, first, uh, let's uh, have a brief look at uh, the problem of deep packet inspection. DP, uh, deep packet inspection or DPI is a service. Uh, is a middle box is a middle box service, and uh, basically it just filters or redirects uh, traffic based on a set of rules in it. Uh, so you can use it as uh, inter for intrusion detection, data loss prevention, or just uh, bandwidth management. Uh, uh, DP, uh, idea of DPI is uh, to see. Uh, what's in the packet uh, you, it is transmitting and uh, it is uh, based on regular expressions. So uh, we can uh, formulate 
task uh, like this. We have a set of regular expressions and uh, there are messages and we need to match uh, specified uh, messages for some regular expression. So uh, actually it is a very popular task, task and uh, it is very uh, difficult uh, uh, and complex. So uh, it becomes one of the most resource consuming tasks on the data plane. So uh, let's have a brief look at the solutions that we already have. Uh, there are two main concepts. First is deterministic finite automaton, and the second is deterministic and non deterministic finite automaton. So uh, it uh, turns into a, cl a classic uh, memory speed trade off. Uh, in the first case, we have uh, fast uh, lookup time, but uh, number of states in automaton can be exponential. Uh, of, uh, so when we merge uh, many of the deterministic finite automaton, as we have a set of rules and there are many rules in it, uh, it becomes uh, too complex. And the second, is, uh, the second uh, way of uh, representation is non-deterministic finite automaton. Uh, there are lookup times uh, becomes uh, uh, the lookup time there can be exponential, but the number of state of states uh, is uh, keeping uh, B linear. And there are also some uh, hybrid solutions, uh, which is combination of uh, both techniques. So uh, to catch the idea of our paper, let's first look at the, our previous paper, which was presented on. Uh, uh, we, uh, which was presented on SIGCOM conference and uh, uh, it is quite simple. So I guess it will be good to find idea on the simple, uh, on the simple task and then uh, it will be easy to find out what we've done in our paper. So uh, the task is uh, pretty well known. Well, it, this is a packet classification task and uh, uh, there are uh, some rules uh, which are represented by the set of ranges. And uh, in input, we have uh, some packet, uh, like here we have a packet four, seven, and five, and a set of rules uh, which are represented by ranges. So there are three rules, uh, R1, R2, and R3. So, and uh, the main idea is that uh, we don't, well, we do not need to check Oh, uh, and we need to find out uh, the rule which uh, matches the given packet. Also in this task, uh, rules are values disjoint and we will utilize uh, this, uh, uh, we will utilize uh, this next. So uh, for incoming packet, uh, we can check only first, uh, uh, only first parameter and define uh, which rule match this packet. But uh, uh, after we check only first rule, we, uh, we also can accept some uh, packet which uh, previously do not match uh, the found rule. So then we apply a false positive test on it and uh, uh, then we can determine if it is really matches this rule or uh, that was uh, just a false positive result. So uh, this technique can reduce number of uh, am amount of space for storing uh, for for storing uh, these ranges. And uh, our in our paper we are using the same technique in a more general case uh, in the case of DPI. So. Uh, regular expressions is a way more complex, uh, uh, have a way more complex structure than uh, ranges. Uh, and uh, here we're trying to apply such technique for them. So uh, what, uh, what do we have in a regular expressions case? Uh, as I already said, it has a more complex structure uh, and uh, disjointness uh, now isn't uh, too obvious because uh, when uh, two ranges are disjoint, we can just check uh, the borders of uh, ranges. 
but here uh, we need to check if two uh, regular expressions are disjoint. So uh, to to do it, we choose only regular expression which are starting with cap or end with a dollar sign. That means that matching starts uh, from the beginning of the string or ends with the end of the string. And such techniques uh, makes uh, makes able to find reg uh, disjoint regular expressions. So, um, when uh, he here we have a semi equivalent uh, packet classifier, but in our case we will we are introducing a semi equivalent DFA. So, uh, it, uh, it matches uh, two main rules. First, each regular expression has a, se uh, has a separate uh, terminal states, and uh, the second if uh, an input string uh, was matched by some regular expression, it uh, still needs to be matched by it. Uh, otherwise, if uh, some string uh, uh, didn't match any regular expression, it may lead to any state. So uh, now lookup process will be uh, like this. Assume we have three regular expression x, y, and z, and uh, we're matching the string uh, A, C, B, A, and uh, there are only three letters in our alphabet. So we are uh, starting matching it from the beginning of our DFA, and uh, uh, after it matched, so in, as in output we will get uh, this automaton. Uh, automaton, I will show how to get this automaton uh, in the for, uh, next. So we, at first, we just match uh, on the beginning of uh, the string, and then we determine if it is, uh, really matches the regular expression with a false positive check, and any method can be applied for this check. So uh, let me show, uh, I guess, then I can show you how to construct as EDFA, but uh, I guess I can do it next after maybe someone wants to ask any questions and then I will show you how to construct as EDFA. So uh, does anyone has any questions uh, before I introduce uh, the algorithm? Well, actually, I have a question, but it's a more general question. So it's not a technical one. So I think that it's better if you go through the algorithm, then I will give my oh, question okay. at the end. I think. Okay, uh, I hope it won't take long. So uh, let me have three regular expressions. Uh, all of them are anchored and starting from the cap. Uh, so then we but first we need to construct combined DFA. It's, it will be quite complex and it has a lot of states in it and then we are trying to optimize it. Uh, first we need to uh, shrink all the states which lead to the same terminal and leave uh, only one terminal for each rule. So here we can see the red uh, one, uh, the, uh, the red states lead only to X rule, uh, green for Y rule and uh, the only rule leading to Z is uh, the bottom one. Then we just shrink it and drop all uh, the transitions uh, for these states. Uh, and uh, here we have uh, a automata automaton like this. Uh, after this operation, automata is no more equivalent uh, to the previous ones. Mm -hmm. So we can, so now we need to check, uh, we need to apply that uh, false positive check because if now uh, some string matches X, for example, uh, it uh, matches X question mark, for example, it can not match uh, the original X uh, re regular expression. So uh, then we just to compre uh, just compress our DFA and uh, uh, shrink uh, the pairs of states without conflict transitions. 
So here we uh, transition uh, two states have no conflict if there is no transition which leads to the uh, different uh, states by the same symbol. So here we can see there, uh, we found uh, this pair and uh, there is no transitions which lead uh, to the uh, different states. Uh, we can check uh, for B, we both lead to Y question mark and for C here we have a uh, transition and uh, in the bottom one we, doesn't, we do not have any transition by symbol C. So we just uh, shrink it and uh, and then find another pair. So here the same thing. Uh, by symbol B both lead to Y and uh, we can shrink it too. So finally we get uh, this DFA, uh, SE DFA. So the SE DFA uh, is basically a DFA but it uh, doesn't match the uh, set of rule which was in uh, original problem. So uh, it has only four states, uh, and uh, this is significantly significantly smaller than uh, than here. So, uh, as a result, uh, we ta uh, we've taken um, we've taken uh, five hundred real world regular expressions from Snow database and compound amount of states in DFA and SEDFA. So and we found and we found out that uh, SEDFA gives uh, like uh, four times less uh, states in a at, in automata. So uh, this can be helpful uh, in uh, deep in deep packet inspection to because memory is uh, important. Uh, for such resource consuming task. Uh, and and uh, let me briefly talk about future study. At first, we can uh, have, we are trying to implement some more efficient heuristics construction as EDFA uh, because this was just a simple one and we will use it uh, as a baseline in a future study. And uh, also, we need to know how to deal with non-disjoint regular expressions Be, uh, because uh, uh, there, there isn't uh, all of regular expressions are very really disjoint but uh, probably we can utilize some structural properties uh, to make them very really disjoint and also we can uh, try to work with multi-group representation uh, this is uh, the same thing, but uh, in the false positive check, uh, we can match not only the one rule, but uh, a group of rule from the set of rules. Uh, so that's it. Uh, I guess now I can answer your questions. Well, um, my question that I want to ask you before, it's a general one in the sense that I'm not an expert in deep packet inspection, but I know that uh, machine learning is used a lot in this case, and I have studied something about that. But in your cases, you decided to use a, a, a more classical approach using regular expression. Could you tell me why? You so, prefer a uh, classical approach, I mean, it's faster, probably it's faster, or um, what can be the pros and cons of using a classical approach instead of a data-driven approach like machine learning or deep learning? Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I guess uh, we can, I actually don't know uh, much about uh, machine learning in deep packet inspection, but I guess uh, there is still can be some automatas and all previous works in uh, atom in in automata are use the same structure so uh, they just uh, change structure and uh, but but automata automaton still equivalent to the 
original ones. But in our techniques, without false positive check, it is inequivalent, and this inequivalence can significantly, significantly reduce amount of states in resulting automata. So probably we can utilize this technique uh, in further papers, uh, probably in machine learning too, because if it is based on uh, on simple DFA or NFA, we can just change uh, DFA or NFA on our SE DFA and we will still uh, get uh, memory consumption reduced. Okay, thank you. Hi, this has been Chenzo Mancuso. Uh, I, I remember some time ago, Kirill Kogan was presenting to me something uh, which uh, reminds me of what you what you have now, for some reason, I guess. Uh, um, so, in terms of uh, in terms of speed, uh, what is what is the what is the gain of uh, of using this regular expression the way you propose rather than? Uh, the, 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 the way it was done in, in the past. I remember so, Kirill was, was explaining to me that, uh, that this thing can be really efficient. So, uh, okay, I understand your question. Uh, at first, uh, we, we, we are de decreasing amount of states and uh, this gives us ability to uh, in, uh, decrease memory consumption so we can put uh, more, uh, I guess, just more rules in uh, hardware or uh, something like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the second uh, idea is uh, that uh, we use, th there is a DF DFA uh, beneath the SE DFA and DFA guarantees us uh, linear lookup time, which is uh, optimal. Linear, okay. And yeah, yeah. Uh, also decreasing amount of states uh, leads to a smaller worst case uh, lookup and uh, it will be uh, good for algorithms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, but, uh, more or less what I expected that, that was possible to do, but I wasn't sure where, where you were. <laughs> Sorry, actually, I didn't. I didn't see most of your presentation because I was uh, on a, on, a, on another channel with a different poster. That's why. So mm. I guess I can repeat. Uh, part of it. No, maybe maybe you can show me some results. Uh, what was the key results that you have? Uh, so uh, the main result is, uh, I guess, this uh, table mm -hmm. that uh, for 500 uh, real world regular expressions, we decreased memory consumption uh, in four times. Mm -hmm. It's good. It's very good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not bad. Good. Uh, I, I, I wish I would see more papers of, of you and your co-authors uh, soon around. Uh, I'm sure you will. <laughs> you I, will I hope we will. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, I, I will have to jump to another session. You know, I, I'm one of the co-organizers, so I need to <laughs> keep an eye on all presentations. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you very much for your questions. Really. Thanks, Steve. Um, one question about um, if, if you want to, you know, in, decrease the latency in, in the processing, how about parallelization? How would uh, your algorithm um, fare for that? Uh, so uh, could you repeat the question? Uh, what about pro... Uh, if I wanted to parallelize uh, the algorithm, oh, you know, okay. would, it, would it easily be able, let's say, you know, I, I'm, I'm having a... Uh, 48 core CPU where I'm doing DPI. So but I uh, parallelize easily okay. with linear gain. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I guess for, uh, so here we have a false positive check and uh, uh, actually uh, if we even have uh, a non-parallel uh, main, uh, main SE DFA, we can parallel uh, all the false positive test because uh, they uh, just uh, this is uh, just different ta tasks and uh, they are not depending on each other. Okay. So, uh, 
if probably we can parallel the main uh, DFA, SE DFA2 because sure. we just uh, traverse the DFA and we can, uh, it, it doesn't no, change. No, with DFA it's clear that it's easily parallelizable by partitioning the uh, search space, but um, I, I'm not really sure I completely understood your algorithm, so that's why I'm asking. Uh, so, uh, are, are you talking about uh, lookup algorithm or just algorithm of uh, building of constructing SEDFA? No, no, so the, uh, the the complete run when when examining packets. That's that's obviously the interesting one. So, uh, okay, let me show you uh, on this uh, this this is this on this slide. So mm -hmm. here we have uh, SEDFA, which is uh, consists of uh, five states, mm -hmm. and uh, you just at, fir at first you just traverse over it, and uh, uh, all you need to know is uh, the state uh, is the current state of it. So you're starting in the starting state uh, on the left, and then just traverse over it. So I guess it can be parallelized because the structure of the DFA isn't changed in the process of of traversing. Mm -hmm. So you can just uh, run uh, different, uh, run it on different okay. strings but in parallel and uh, they will parallel just traverse over it. And uh, finally, all of them will uh, get to some uh, resulting state. And for each resulting state, you can apply false positive check, uh, and uh, they uh, these checks are completely independent. Okay. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you for your question. My name is Chanyong Park, and I'm at Hanyang University. And today, I'm going to talk about a configurable Redfish Query Web Server module, which can run with a proxy module. Our goal with this module was to create a flexible web server module that can help query processing of Redfish services across various server vendors. We implemented a prototype as Nginx web server module shown as yellow box in the figure. So what are BMC and Redfish? The baseboard management controller, BMC, is a specialized microcontroller embedded on the motherboard. The BMC manages the interface between system management software and the platform hardware. Our server vendors provide a service between user and their system management software, such as HP's ILO and Dell's IDREC and OpenBMC's BMC Web. Users can control and monitor server hardware through these services by various protocols like IPMI and Redfish, or even you can control the, with the web GUI through the web browsers. So then what is Redfish Core? The Redfish is a relatively new server management API, and it follows the open data protocols data format. Open data protocol called OData provides a standardized client-side core features. And these features are specified as optional in the Redfish specification. And they suggest to support small set of OData queries and a couple of new queries which are created by them. So what's hard and what is our approach? The hard case we focused on was each vendor supports Redfish query in different resources with different query parameters. For example, vendor A supports filter query parameter in resource chassis, and vendor B supports top and skip query parameters in resource events, and vendor C supports select query parameters in all resources, and vendor B may not support any query. And it can be a bit confusing to client users. So why this happening? I think the implementing query features are not super easy things and pretty time consuming to developers. Because if BMC system put all data into a single relational database, then they can easily implement query features by implementing a query translation layer between OData and SQL 
However, if not, then developers should implement every query features in their data layer by themselves. And all data ecosystem is mature in some platforms and languages like ASP.NET, so developers have narrow choice, and most importantly, the query features are optional. And our approach to, to, to that is to make a proxy server between Redfish services and clients and processing queries instead of Redfish services. And it can be implemented by sending additional requests and merging and reformatting the responses. This process is similar with Redfish's official client program called Redfish Tool. And they do similar things to some resources with some query features. So I can say they, there are two main differences with the Redfish Tool. One is we target all Redfish resources and query features. And the second is we can leverage backend servers query processing by configuration. Let's assume our module receives a request with a combination of query parameters. If the backend service can process expand query parameters and the module knows that by configuration, then the module delegates processing expand query to backend service and only process the rest of core parameters. It can be much faster than processing all query parameters on proxy server or client side. If the resource handler can, can process any query parameters, then the module process all query parameters like in figure A. To experiment, BMC software and proxy server is set up in a machine which has a Cortex-A53 ARM processor with 16 gigabyte of RAM. And we set up two Redfish services. One is OpenBMC's BMC Web and the other is DMTF's Redfish mockup server. And Redfish tool is used to client program. There are six bars in each scenario and it's too complicated. So let's focus on only the first two bar graphs, LAN P and LAN NP, which are the most common case in real world. LAN means the client program and BMC software are connected in local network. And LAN P stands for proxy, which means requests are through the proxy and query module. And NP stands for no proxy, which means bypassing the proxy. So experiment scenario A sent a request without query and it shows the overhead of using proxy compared to request directly. The overhead was about three milliseconds and 6% of response time. However, performance improvements were observed in all other scenarios with using query parameters, especially the scenario C, the proxy delegates processing expand query to the backend Redfish service, the performance is improved by about 80%. So to conclude, this module can process Redfish core parameters, which can delegate part of processing to backend service. And it shows the possibilities of performance improvements and help Redfish services to fully support core features. We plan to continue developing to support all query features specified by Redfish and adding some more mechanisms like caching and testing in various environments. So, okay, thank you very much. And my name again is Chanyoung Park and I'm at Hanyang University CPS Lab. You can find me with this email. I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much.